Hello once again, thanks for joining us. This is Space Nuts, where we talk astronomy, space science, recipes, and how to change a tyre. Uh, and my name is Andrew Dunkley, your host, and coming up on this episode, we'll be talking about the fastest stars in the galaxy, and apparently it's eye-popping how fast they're going, and a potential solution to space junk that might be a bit more promising than some of the others that we've talked about in the past, and of course, we'll look at some audience questions about Siding Spring Observatory, the Great Attractor, and uh, factors that affected light we're seeing today that no longer exist. And does that make a difference? All that coming up on this edition of Space Nuts. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space nuts. report, it feels good. And joining me as always is his good self, Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large as the emails roll in. Hello, Fred. <laughs> Hi, Andrew. Good to see you again. I'm, I've got my tire lever, but I'm still looking for the recipe book now yes. for this episode. <laughs> mm, yeah, galactic cookies are uh, the order of the day. Um, now, uh, if you're wondering why Fred looks a bit funny and sounds a bit funny, it's because uh, his Jurassic 2.1 operating system has finally said you can no longer use your computer unless you update your uh, uh, browser. And uh, unfortunately, um, he can't <laughs> because of Jurassic 2.0 yeah. or whatever That's system it is. Yes, never mind. Uh, but we will carry on. We always find a way around the problems which we've been having quite a few of in recent times, unfortunately. But that's uh, that's life. How are you, Fred, by the way? We haven't very seen well. each other for yonks. Yeah, very well, thank you. Um, I uh, I was um, at an interesting event uh, a couple of days ago uh, in Canberra, which was the launch of something called Einstein First and something else called Quantum Girls. And these are two initiatives that are uh, being put forward to bring science teaching uh, in Australia into the, well, the 20th century uh, by recognizing that what really turns kids on is the exciting stuff like relativity uh, uh, and quantum physics, which are not really taught in, in, a, in a big way in schools. They're, they're sort of brushed over a bit. Yeah. But this, this um, program is designed to give kids a hands-on experience of both of these things. Well, these two programs, there are two of them. So I was at the launch of that at the uh, Australian Academy of Science. Uh, Dr. David Blair and uh, actually Professor David Blair, and Professor Su Susan Scott, uh, leading the charge on those two initiatives. Uh, a great uh, way of attracting kids generally into science, but in particular, of course, uh, young women uh, and girls to get them uh, turned on by quantum physics and relativity. Fantastic. We've got a similar thing happening tomorrow in Dubbo with uh, a Girls in Aviation Day. Uh, and uh, lots of astronauts have started their careers in aviation. Yep. So uh, that's that's a big one for us. And it uh, starts at the age of eight, this uh, particular program. So that's that's going to be great. My, my um, eldest granddaughter is not quite old enough, but I reckon if she went, she'd tell everyone how they're doing it. You know, she <laughs> she's not backwards in coming forwards. I remember, I'll tell you this story, we were at school the other, uh, a while ago now, picking her up and um, there's a there's a sort of a drop on drop off, off section at the school, a lot of schools have those, and uh, a lady parked her car at, at, at a very severe angle into the curb <laughs> and my granddaughter just walked up and looked at her and said, are you allowed to do that? <laughs> she didn't have an answer. Oh, she she did not have an answer. No. Yeah, it was very funny. Kids, they just, you know, no filter. All right, uh, let's move on to our first topic. And we're looking at the fastest stars in the galaxy, or are they too fast to look at? That's the question. They're pretty uh, yes. quick. Great question. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's actually a topic close to my heart is this, because um, when uh, I was involved with the RAVE survey, the radial velocity experiment, which was a survey of star speeds and other data about stars uh, carried out at Siding Spring Observatory on the UK Schmidt Telescope, and I used to be the astronomer in charge there. Uh, that survey, one of the things that we were doing was looking for high velocity stars, stars that seem to break the speed limits. Mm. And I think the fastest we found was about 400 kilometers per second, uh, which uh, is still a pretty impressive 
speed when you uh, when you, you know when you think of, uh, uh, of of things like the Earth's uh, movement, the Earth's revolution around the Sun, which is a steady thirty kilometers per second. Yeah, that's a pretty normal speed for celestial objects. But these things were going at four hundred. Um, but um, since then, this this you know, all that was a decade ago, and much more research has been done on this topic. And uh, until a couple of weeks ago, uh, there were only ten stars that were known to be moving fast enough to exceed the galaxy's escape velocity. Wow! Uh, and uh, they um, they they were uh, essentially uh, uh, stars with velocities not that much different from the ones we were finding. Four, five, five hundred, something like that. Mm. Uh, but uh, some data that's come actually from the the Gaia spacecraft, G A I A, uh, which you and I have spoken about before. It's yeah. a, sp- a spacecraft that measures positions of stars very, very accurately on the sky. And of course, if you do that, um, you know, measure a position one year and then the same position a couple of years later, you can detect the motion of the star. And that's how these new record breakers have been found. Um, so the six more stars that are now known to be escaping our galaxy, mm. and two of them uh, are the record breakers. Uh, the runner-up in the galaxy uh, escape velocity, uh, sorry, the galaxy runaway star velocity uh, Olympic statistics. <laughs> yeah, what's the word again? Uh, the the runner-up in the it's, it's the um, it's, uh, that's right. It's the, it's the silver medalist. That's right. Yes. Well, yeah. I knew where you were going. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't get there. Uh, too many other things going on. All right. The runner-up, the silver medalist in the runaway star record-breaking attempt, is a star whose name I'll read in a minute. It's a bit boring, <laughs> but, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> but its velocity is a cool one thousand six hundred and ninety-four kilometers per second. Whoa. Um, which is very fast. Uh, I could pro- probably, I can't do it in my head, but I could quickly turn that into kilometers an hour. Mm. Um, it's a lot. Uh, multiply it by 3,600 and you'll get the answer. Uh, now, that's the silver medalist, but the gold medalist in this uh, competition, not that it is a competition, uh, is a star that is moving at 2,285 kilometers per second. Just over uh, six million kilometers an hour. That first one. Yeah, 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 what was the exactly. speed of the second one? Two thousand two hundred eighty-five kilometers per second. So that's uh, eight uh, eight and a quarter million kilometers an hour. It's an hour. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's pretty good going. Uh, and uh, you know the, the the way I see when I see a number like that, I think, wow, that is not far short of one percent of the speed of light. Now. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't sound like much, 1% of the speed of light, uh, 300,000 kilometers per second. But uh, an object moving at that velocity, you will certainly see what we were just talking about a few minutes ago, relativistic effects. Mm. Uh, in other words, um, you know, that it would, you, if we could see time going on on planets around that star, we'd see the effects of time dilation, uh, the time apparently slowing down. That's something moving at a high velocity. Would they have? Uh, would they have planets if they're going that fast? Uh, yeah. Well, that's a really good question um, because uh, that you know the, the next thing I was going to talk about, and it has bearing on on your your question there, is how did they get to these crazy velocities? That was my other question. <laughs> and it might be uh, that the mechanism that took them to that uh, to those crazy velocities. Uh, would actually strip them of any planets uh, yeah. if there were planets. Because what uh, is being conjectured uh, about, uh, you know, get, get, getting the, the uh, stars to these crazy, crazy speeds is that what you have is a star that's been ejected from um, a, a, a binary system. In other words, a pair of stars, yeah. one of which is a white dwarf star, and white dwarfs we've talked about before, one of Rusty's favorite objects. Mm. Uh, it, it, these, these are the stars at the end of their, uh, their you know, evolutionary life. Uh, and um, basically, uh, if you add material to a white dwarf star, and sometimes they do leach material off a companion star if they've got one in orbit around it, when you do that, eventually you get to a point where the white dwarf doesn't like it anymore and explodes. Oh, uh, in a in what we call a type one A supernova, 
uh, and that uh, is thought to be um, one of the possible scenarios in which you could blast out of a, a binary pair the companion star of one of these exploding white dwarfs. And mm. So this thing hairs off into the wide blue yonder um, at great velocity, um, and it may well leave its planets behind uh, if they withstood the explosion anyway. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so that's a really, really good question. Uh, there's, there's some uh, subtleties about uh, the, uh, the the explosion sequence. There are, there are various types of uh, supernova explosion caused by these binary systems. And the one that's favoured, um, and I, I, I can't really talk uh, about this in, in detail, uh, but it's called a double, de a double detonation. The thing explodes twice. Uh, and so uh, that is thought to be the thing that will give it energy sufficient to leave the, the you know, leave the galaxy at these extraordinary velocities. And that happens to me after I eat curry. Um, if they go, I don't, I don't wish to know that. <laughs> uh, dear. Um, just sort of a backup joke to that, but I won't say it. Yes, I will. Same color too. Uh, we, um, we know their speeds and, and they're traveling at a rate of knots and, and it's quite an incredible speed. Uh, are they going to exit the galaxy or could they hit something in the process? Or is it likely that if they're approaching something, the gravitational effect will send them sort of in another direction? Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a, another great question. It, it, it's um, so, I mean, the, you know, the bottom line is space is big as Douglas Adams said, uh, and the, there's a lot of space between the objects. So the, the, the chances of them hitting something else are probably fairly low. Mm. Uh, but what, what may happen is a close encounter with another object, maybe a star or possibly even a giant molecular cloud. These are you know huge aggregations of, of gas and dust where we think stars are being formed. Um, all, all of those objects would have enough gravitational pull, probably not to capture the star because its velocity is just so high. Yeah. But it might deflect it slightly. You know, as it passes something massive, it, it may well be deflected slightly. So it, its angle, it, the direction in which it's traveling changes very slightly. Okay. Um, but it, it's hard to imagine anything other than possibly a black hole uh, having sufficient gravitational pull to capture it into orbit around it or even to suck it in. Mm. Uh, so maybe, you know, maybe these stars have got a long, long trek of a few millions, tens or hundreds of millions of years uh, as they leave our galaxy and head for another one. Um, it may well be that uh, they might uh, you know, plunge into the center of that other galaxy, get swallowed up by the supermassive black hole at the middle. But I think that is such a low odds probability uh, that you might as well just think of it going forever. Yeah, wow. That's probably what, it'll do. what is the um, required exit speed to get out of the galaxy? Yeah. Um, that that takes me back to the work I was talking about before. Um, yeah. it, and and it, it, it depends where you are in the galaxy. Um, at, at the radius of the sun, uh, in other words, at our distance from the galactic center, which is somewhere in the region of 25,000 light years, hmm. um, it is it is roughly 400 kilometers per second, uh, if I'm remembering correctly from the, the work that we did earlier. So some of those stars uh, that we were seeing were... You know the, the the ones that might just be squeezing out of uh, of leaving the galaxy, uh, but they're, they're nothing like uh, the, the the ones that we're talking about now. Yeah, um, but they're still going to take me, a long time. Yeah, let me let me um, let me just um, identify these objects. The oh, yeah. uh, the the silver medalist is J twelve thirty five, and the uh, gold medalist is J zero nine two seven. Okay. These are quite short names for astronomers, aren't they? And, and how far away are they? Do we know? Uh, that's a good question. I don't have that uh, the, that information in front of me, but I could check it out right. as uh, as a bit of homework there, because it will be interesting to know that. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'll follow up on that. The um, um, I can. It's it's actually uh, paper. Let me click on the paper itself it is going to be published in um blah, blah, blah. that's usually journal what it's called sorry open, open journal of astrophysics okay uh, that's where it's going uh and uh let me see whether i can give you a distance for them da, 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 okay. da, da. 
uh, not easily uh, because they're, um, uh, the the the, uh, the abstract of the of the paper does not contain that information. It does contain the velocities, though, and it does suggest that they're white. That they're white dwarfs. Yeah. Um... And a, yeah, a long way away. Uh, I suppose we could look it up on Wikipedia. They'd know. <laughs> they, they'd, they'd have the answer. Um, but yeah, that's that, those speeds are staggering. Absolutely staggering. Um, and and there'd probably be a lot more out there, I imagine, Fred. Yeah, that's right. When you whenever you find things like this, you're usually seeing the, you know, just the the most. Um, easily accessible of a much larger population and by easily accessible i mean bright enough to be able to see with the guy a spacecraft mm. very good all right um and fred mentioned the paper but if you um want to find out more there's also a great article on phys phys phys.org this is space nuts with andrew dunkley and professor fred okay we checked all four systems and team with a go space nuts Yes, and uh, speaking of very fast uh, objects and uh, ones that are very close to us, uh, things in orbit. And a lot of those things are pieces of space junk, which are starting to become a huge, huge problem, are they not, Fred? They are, yes. There's, um, you know, we're, we, we're faced with, um, uh, a, 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 well, a, a, a number of issues when it comes to space junk. Uh, and I guess the biggest problem is the defunct satellites, the, the satellites that have done their job, that run out of whatever propellants they need. Yep. Uh, maybe the solar panels have got cracked or something like that, but they're at the end of their life. And there's about uh, two and a half thousand of those, 2,200 or thereabouts defunct satellites. Now, of course, there's another problem, and that is the smaller stuff. And there's uh, well over 20, and it might even be more like 30 or 50,000 now, uh, bits of debris which attract uh, stuff that's bigger than 100 millimetres across four inches. Uh, and then when you think about things that are smaller than that, which is not tracked, mm. uh, it's in the tens of millions. Yeah, and we're uh, talking pieces. about everything from flecks of paint to tiny little pieces of, of metal. Bits of screws and things yeah. of that sort. That are, yeah. So um, uh, what, what we're talking about here, though, is uh, a, um, essentially an, an endeavour to try and at least alleviate part of that problem. And the part in particular that the, this company uh, that I'm going to talk about is aiming for are the defunct satellites, satellites that are still intact, they're in orbit, but they're not doing anything anymore. Mm. Uh, and it may well be that the uh, operator of those satellites wants to deorbit them and make them safe so that they, they that basically slow down they come down through the atmosphere, burn up, and, and that's the end of the problem. Uh, they are contributing perhaps to some of the pollutants in the Earth's atmosphere, but that's a much smaller issue than, than the debris around, uh, around our planet. And so um, you and I have spoken before about the various methods that uh, uh, organizations have suggested, both commercial and space agency organizations, yes. uh, to, to try and do this, uh, involving some of them involve grapnels, some of them involve nets where you shoot a net at something and then uh, put a drag on it so it, it slows down. Yep. Well, this is a, a harpoons. Huge... Yeah, harpoons. That's right. That was another one. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. This is a company. Uh, it's a Japanese country company called Astroscale, uh, who uh, have, and in fact, they're funded partly by the UK and the European space agencies. So they've got significant uh, resources that they're putting into this project. Um, and what they've done, they've sort of devised uh, a reusable robotic tug uh, that will uh, essentially deal with this problem. Uh, their mantra is rendezvous, retrograde, burn, and repeat. Uh, so by that, they mean you find the spacecraft that you're, uh, what they call the client spacecraft, the one that you want to bring down, um, you uh, rendezvous with it and then it's inspected uh this uh little device that the, the robotic tug actually has a look around just to make sure things intact and where can you hang hang on to it um and then uh by using a magnetic grapnel uh, they attach the spacecraft to it the, the the robotic tug spacecraft uh fire the braking rockets on the tug uh which slows uh them down uh, and then that injects the client spacecraft, the one they're trying to get rid of, into an orbit that will 
um, very quickly degrade because of atmospheric friction. Uh, they let go of it. That flying spacecraft heads down to Earth, perhaps makes another two or three complete orbits before it, it finally burns up. But then they fire rocket motors on the tug to put it back into a safe orbit so it wow. can go to its next client. Uh, and they So wash, wash, rinse, and repeat. Yes, that's, right. yeah. that, that's the thing. Uh, exactly. Rendezvous, retrograde, burn, and repeat. And it's the repeat that is the new aspect of this because this uh, little robotic tug has the wherewithal to do this uh, several times. Hmm. It's called ELSA. That's Sorry. the name they've given to it. ELSA. ELSA. E-L-S-A. And it is an acronym for End of Life Service by Astroscale. Yeah. Astroscale being the name of the company. Gee, you know, I wish they'd put the naming of these things out to tender because I was going for Junkie McJunkface. <laughs> I said, well, that's right. Who who could do better than that? I know. I, don't, I think that's great. Because you know where I got that from. It's because there was a tugboat in the UK. They did a public uh, a public uh, online thing to get a name for it, and someone suggested Boaty McBoatface, and it got 75% of the vote, and they, they, did, and they didn't do it. No, I reckon it's awesome. No, it, it, I, I think it's a pretty good one as well. I like uh, that. Junkie, mate, junk, junk face. <laughs> yes, I, I do quite like that. Yes. Um, so they've they've done a a, 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 a test flight already uh, with a prototype model of this. This is Astroscale back in 2021. Showed uh, that it could uh, do its repeated magnetic capture trick. Um, and that then there was a pause uh, by the company in its operations because there was some issue with the spacecraft, which they claim now to have fixed. Uh, and so um, they will actually be, I think it's next year, they've got another test flight, if I'm mm -hmm. remembering correctly. Uh, but they, uh, basically they say that they're, the new spacecraft, what they're calling the Generation 2, uh, 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 with a docking plate, that's the thing that lets you grab onto the uh, client satellite. They say it's got a lifespan of 15 years, um, which is really, you know, quite a long time when you think of what this thing is trying to do. If it's pottering around, grabbing spacecraft, bringing them down in response to the you know, the owners of those spacecraft requesting that, because you'd have to do that or else it becomes an act of uh, space terrorism if you grab somebody else's spacecraft and dump that uh, when they don't want it. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's um, it's a very interesting prospect, uh, and I think we might see, see more of this company uh, and more news about how um, the experiments are progressing, uh, and it will be great to see it actually in service uh, yeah. if that is the case within the next couple of years. Yeah, uh, what does it, I suppose when it's at end of life, it will self. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, Degrade. The, 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 I mean, today, uh, as part of the approval process for launching any satellite, you've got to have a strategy mm. for the end of its life. And so today's satellites um, can actually, you know, they, they can do it themselves. They can bring themselves into that orbit that will cause them to to break up and i think i'm right in saying that um, starlink satellites that's uh, spacex's flagship internet provider system uh they have a an operational lifetime of five years if i remember rightly and then they will they will burn up in the atmosphere mm. uh, so and today that's a that's mandated you've got to show before you get the ticket to launch you've got to show that um uh, you can bring, you know, you can get rid of the spacecraft at the end of its life. Yeah, uh, it's I um, so, so. I guess we'll reach a time where all the ones that can't do that are dealt with, and then we've got a um, a situation where it's going to be self-solving. Yes, but in the in the meantime, we at the moment have seven thousand seven hundred and two active satellites in Earth orbit. Correct. That's and, and that changes almost every day, yeah. but that that's that a massive number. It is, and that actually includes um, that includes the cubesats, uh, mm. because if you look at uh, the the bigger spacecraft uh, satellites that are more than one hundred kilograms, it's about five thousand. Yeah, a uh, little bit more than five thousand. So that and most of those are Starlink. Actually, most of them are yeah. Starlink. When you consider uh, so, that um, sixty years ago there were none, or maybe yeah, one. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Uh, so. Um, 
so you, you're absolutely right. I think you know AstroScale's mission is really addressing those 2,200 defunct uh, spacecraft that are in orbit. Uh, and that will um, that will we hope address that issue well and perhaps make say, space a more safe and sustainable place. So does that mean there's there's almost 10,000 of them of them up there use that are in use and past their use by date? Yeah, it sounds uh, like. That's right. Yeah, the, the, but these, these are the bigger objects. Yes, yeah, because right. it, it gets to you know when you look at the smaller things, the numbers blow out um, yeah. hugely. Mm. Okay, uh, very good. Uh, listen, I'm going to. I'd normally hold this for our question and answer uh, episode, but um, I, j because we've talked about this a few times lately, I thought I'd throw it in uh, late in this segment. Uh, I don't have a name for this, but uh, because we've talked about it, we've been asked for you to explain what a hybrid eclipse is. So maybe we can just tack that onto this little um, parcel of the program. Yeah, okay. Delighted to. And indeed, I witnessed the hybrid eclipse a couple of months ago. Yeah. Uh, in uh, in off Western Australia. So, it, so think about um, uh, an observer on Earth uh, watching a total eclipse of the sun and as... We know what happens is the moon's shadow uh, passes over you, and what you see from the surface is the disk of the moon crossing over to, to completely obscure the sun. Yeah. So the sun's completely obscured in a total eclipse of the sun, and it, it's uh, by the by the sun I mean actually what we call the photosphere, the visible disk of the sun. We we can then see the outer atmosphere, and that was beautiful, uh, beautifully shown in the April twentieth eclipse. Um, however, there is another type, uh, and it, it comes about because the both the Earth's orbit around the Sun and the Moon's orbit around the Earth, they're both ellipses, they're not circular, and so the distance be distances between these objects vary slightly. And so there is another scenario where the Moon is just a little bit too far away to fully cover the disk of the Sun, and so what you get is what's called an annular, an oh. annular eclipse or a ring of fire eclipse, because you still see the disk of the sun, uh, a ring of the disk of the sun surrounding the dark moon. So the moon's just too far away. Now, the hybrid one uh, is effectively an annular eclipse at the start and end. But in the middle, uh, you know, where, where, the, where the, as the moon's shadow moves across the Earth, uh, it's the curvature of the Earth itself that brings you slightly nearer to where the eclipse uh, uh, to, to, to the moon's disk. And so what you actually see, uh, if you're in the right part of the uh, path of the uh, eclipse, you will see uh, a total eclipse of the sun. But if you're at each end of the, of the moon's uh, uh, shadow, the, the sh path of the moon's shadow on the planet, you will see uh, a, an annular eclipse. And the reason why I'm struggling for words here is that I just had a message coming up saying my battery's running out. So I'm just going to plug some power. Oh, 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 well, that might explain why your face disappeared too. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so my face might come back. I'm going to close that. Uh, and there he is. Yeah. yeah. So I've now got power going to the phone. <laughs> I should have thought of that. Uh, as, as you will gather, our listeners and watchers, we're in new territory here with a, mm. a new trick. Yeah, we had to find a workaround for a technical problem. So Fred's doing everything on his phone today. Okay, so there's all sorts of situations where the what you're seeing of the eclipse can vary depending on where you yes, are right. within the shadow, etc. Yeah. So, so no. just uh, to 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 complete that because I didn't explain that very clearly. Um, in the April twentieth eclipse, the the path of the moon's shadow sort of started uh, to cross the Earth over the Indian Ocean. And wound up uh, at the end of it in uh, off the coast of Indonesia, uh, but in the middle, uh, the curvature of the Earth brought you near enough that you would see a total eclipse. But if you were what, what viewing at either end of the path of the moon's shadow, the path of totality, as we call it, then you would have seen an annular eclipse, and that's why it's a hybrid. It's two different kind of eclipses in in one. And mm -hmm. there are, I think, if I remember rightly, uh, let me. Th Think I think it's seven per century on average that you get. It's okay. a small number. Yes. Well, here we would have seen only ten percent uh, of yeah, coverage. Yeah, partial eclipse. But right. it was it was very cloudy, so I saw nothing anyway. Mm. Yeah. So I don't know who asked that, but uh, there's the answer to your question as to what is a hybrid eclipse. 
This is Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here with Professor Fred Watson. Okay, we checked all four systems and team with a go. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, uh, we will continue with questions, and we've got an audio question from Tim, who is actually part of the um, Bytes.com family, as he will explain at the end of this question. Good day, Fred and Andrew. This is Tim Gibbs, the Friday host of Astronomy Daily. Um, I was asked a couple of questions uh, last week by a friend of mine, and I didn't know the answer, so I thought I would come to the font of all knowledge on Siding Springs. Uh, the first question was the Uppsala Schmidt tele uh, telescope um, at Siding Springs, which I think was used by Robin McNaught for a number of years in his NEO um, uh, research. Is that is that te telescope still at Siding Springs, and is it still used for anything? The second question was um, a friend asked. Uh, he had been told that the Earth has a, a second moon. Um, Kruithni or Kruinia, not sure of the pronunciation. Um, and he wondered, is it really a moon? And are there others that people, uh, the general public, do not know about? So, Fred, um, how many moons does the Earth have? Don't forget, folks, you can listen to Astronomy Daily with Steve Dunkley as the host on Mondays and myself, Tim Gibbs, as the host on Fridays. See you soon, guys. Thanks very much. Bye hey. for now. Thank you, Tim, and um, yeah, happy to give you a plug there. But uh, and, and who's that Steve Dunkley guy they keep talking yeah. about? <laughs> mm. I wondered that too. Yes. All right. Your uh, brother? Uh, yeah, he, he, he definitely my brother. Yes. Yeah, must be Steve yeah. Dunkley, the Dunkley brothers. Yes, yes, we could be a band. Well, Steve is a, a very, very accomplished musician, but I don't think I'd help him much in that regard. Um, what was the first question he asked us? <laughs> It's about the Uppsala Schmidt. Yes, that's right. The telescope at Siding Spring. So Tim is correct. Uh, it, it's a telescope called the Uppsala Schmidt. It, that's because it was originally owned by the University of Uppsala in Sweden. Uh, and for a while, I think it was at Mount Stromlo, uh, but came to Siding Spring Observatory. And and by the way, it's not Siding Springs. It's Siding Springs. Spring There's only one of them. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it, it came... Uh, Quite early in the history of the observatory, uh, I can't remember when it when it actually arrived there. Uh, it, it, a Schmidt telescope is a wide-angle telescope originally designed for photography. Uh, it was modified uh, in probably the 1990s uh, to take an electronic camera, a CCD device, charge couple device, and was used very effectively, as Tim said, by Rob McNaught. Uh, now, Rob. Uh, was for uh, many years the world's most notable asteroid hunter uh, looking for near-Earth asteroids. Uh, it was part of a program actually funded by NASA, administered by the ANU, uh, to operate the Uppsala Schmidt. And he was very, very successful uh, in discovering many, many asteroids. And I'm always eternally grateful to him because one of those asteroids is called uh, is it 5691? I can't remember the number, but it's called Fred Watson. Uh, so that's um, that's not one that is going to come near the Earth. In fact, it's probably oh, it's a totally boring asteroid, which it's is, going to, it's it, going to disappear into obscurity. It'll just continue wandering around in the main asteroid belt, ad infinitum, <laughs> uh, and uh, more or less as I do, really. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, so that's the story. But uh, it's now some years ago, and in fact. I can probably date it because this happened round about the same time as the Wombalong fire, which almost took out Siding Spring Observatory yeah. back in 2013. 13th of January 2013, um, the, the Uppsala telescope uh, was not affected by the fire, but that coincided with the time that the funding came to an end and, in fact, Rob retired. Uh, not very willingly, I have to say, because he felt he still had much to contribute. Uh, but um, Rob still does great stuff. He's, uh, uh, I mean, retirement for Rob is probably just more of the same, but with a smaller telescope. Yeah. Uh, he's still doing great stuff. Uh, his Uppsala Schmidt, though, um, is no longer there. Uh, it has been removed. And if I am remembering correctly, it's being restored, I think, by the Tamworth Astronomical Society. Okay. Uh, 5691, by the way, your asteroid. Yeah, that's the mm. one. Five six nine one. Okay, thanks, Tim, and we'll we'll hear you on um, 
Oh, he's got a second question. The second question, yeah, yeah. it's Krugia. It's pronounced. It's uh, I think it's spelled C R U I N T H E. I think, right, which is a Scottish, uh, Scottish Celtic name, you know, Gaelic name, as we'd say. Uh, and it's an object which is not actually a moon of the Earth. It's in a peculiarly resonant orbit with the Earth. It, it sort of sounds if if you imagine your viewpoint of it from the earth it's a kind of kidney shaped orbit uh going around the sun rather than around the earth so it's not a moon yeah. uh, but the reason why tim has asked it along with sidic spring is that that's where it was discovered uh, uh-huh. by another schmidt telescope the one that i used to be responsible for the united kingdom schmidt telescope still there um not operating at the moment but still in an operational condition at sidic spring uh, now in fact owned by the anu but that discovery was made by uh, a duty observer um, who, on, on our staff. Uh, he was there for quite a number of years. His name's Duncan Waldron. Duncan might actually be a Space Nuts listener um, because he uh, looks after the Brisbane Planetarium uh, up there north of the border. So if you're listening to this, Duncan, hello, and I hope I'm telling the truth here. Uh, he was the person who discovered this object in in an asteroid discovery program. Um, essentially, what we did was, with the UK Schmidt Telescope, we were taking survey plates. We were surveying this whole sky, taking these six-degree square photographic plates, uh, showing the stars and other objects. And, of course, in doing that, we picked up asteroids and comets. Mm. Uh, and uh, Trunia was one of the asteroids that was discovered by Duncan Waldron uh, with the UK Schmidt Telescope at Siding Spring Observatory. So thanks for that, Tim. All good stuff. Yeah, very good, Tim. And we'll catch you on the next episode of Astronomy Daily. Um, just as a matter of interest, though, you and Tim would be keen on this. The Pan Stars Telescope in Hawaii has uh, discovered another asteroid that is orbiting Earth at the yeah. moment, uh, 2023 FW13. FW, Fred Watson. That's the one. Mm. <laughs> yeah, which is temporary, though. I think, yes, um, that one is. That, you know, I think that's the thing. Um, there's no permanent second moon. No, not at all. All right. Thank you, Tim. Let's move on to a text question from Jeremy. Uh, please, can you give us an update on the Great Attractor and if the James Webb Telescope will be able to see it more clearly as it's on the far side of the Milky Way galaxy, making it hard to see? Yeah, so great question again. Uh, the Great Attractor is something that was postulated back in the 80s, I think, if I remember rightly, uh, to explain the motions of galaxies in space. When we look uh, into space, we we see ga- lots of galaxies, obviously, uh, but, um, uh, and, and as, as you know, they're all receding from us uh, because of the expansion of the universe. That's called the Hubble flow, mm. uh, the, the flow of galaxies away from us. Uh, the velocities are higher the further away you look. But superimposed on that are what we call peculiar motions, the the, uh, individual motion of a galaxy itself caused by the gravity of other objects around it. And the way to to imagine this is we often use this this analogue. If you think of a river flowing, uh, and then boats on a river, the boats are moving around on the river, but they're all being carried along by the flow itself, the flow of the river. Yep. So they've got their individual velocities, but they th- that's superimposed on the velocity of the flow of the river. And it's the same with the universe. What we call the Hubble flow is the, uh, the, the, the flow of objects due to the expansion. But galaxies have their own motions, peculiar velocities, uh, which are caused by gravitational attraction. Uh, and so back in the, I think, as I said, it was the 80s, uh, the um, astronomers of the day found that a lot of galaxies seem to be pulled to be being pulled towards a point which is behind the disk of our galaxy or it's sort of um, in the same direction as our galactic disk Uh, and that's a region we call the zone of avoidance and that's an old term that goes back to when we didn't know what galaxies were yeah because people astronomers could see that there weren't any of these weird spiral objects in that region and we now know that that's because the milky way's disk is dusty and you can't see through it uh, with visible light telescopes, but you can with infrared telescopes, which is why uh, this is a great question uh, that we uh, we we may well be able to use the the James Webb to look 
more deeply into that region of the Milky Way, which we think hides the Great Attractor. Mm. Now, the latest work on the Great Attractor identifies it with uh, a cluster of galaxies, I think in the constellation of Vela, if I remember rightly. Um, and it's it's thought that it's not as big an object uh, or as big a gravitational congregation, if I can put it that way, uh, as we used to. We think that that motion uh, of objects towards it is partly due to other clusters of galaxies which we can't see. So there is ongoing work on the on the Great Attractor, and no doubt when the James Webb Telescope finally points at it, and that might have already happened, there may be papers in, in, in progress that we haven't seen yet, but I'm sure we will discover more about the Great Attractor from the Webb Telescope. Yeah, I hope so. That'd be exciting. Uh, of course, it comes down to who wants to do what and booking time and all that sort of thing. It's right. It's like trying to get a car park at Sydney Airport, really. <laughs> Sometimes. Uh, that's right. You've got to book it in advance. <laughs> yeah. uh, thanks, Jeremy. I, I know there was a lot more to your question, but we just stuck with the Great Attractor section of it uh, for today. Uh, and David has a question. Uh, there are zero assumptions in my question. It may be a good question. It may be a logical question, but simplistic with known answers, and I'm simply not educated in the field. Say we observe light from a galaxy 10 billion years away. Um, are there not numerous disparate past factors no longer active now over the 10 billion light years of travel to us that have affected the light spectrum we perceive now? If, say, 9 billion years ago, something, anything, uh, the expansion rate of space, the various gases of uh, another galaxy, uh, that is no longer there, etc., caused a shift in the spectrum of light from said galaxy, and that cre uh, causative factor was no longer active. Would the light we perceive now not still carry that past spectrum shift message, despite the fact that the cause of said shift is no longer affecting the light? Love that question. It's got a simple answer, too. No. No, it's yes. That's yes. <laughs> yes. So, um, so David's quite right you know and and there are examples you know there, there are many things uh that that can affect the light when you've got such long light travel times of billions of years mm. um uh one of the commonest things is that perhaps the light may have passed close to uh, a cluster of galaxies which will have deflected it and caused a gravitational lens and even if that cluster of galaxies isn't there anymore, and it probably is, but even if it, if, if it wasn't, uh, the light coming to us would still come from the direction that it looked as though it was coming from because of the gravitational lens and be affected in that way. Yeah. Uh, so yes, light, um, in, in a sense, any you know photon of light that comes to us from deep space bears the scars of whatever it's passed through. Uh, and the most fundamental part of that is the expansion of the universe. So its wavelength is stretched. Uh, by the expansion of the universe. Mm. Uh, but other phenomena like passage through gas clouds and things of that sort, yes, it imprints information on uh, on the uh, light, which is still there, even if the object itself might not be or have moved along somewhere else. That's so, fascinating. Yeah. So that that's intriguing because uh, it does mean that um, you're not just learning about the source of the light, you're learning about what's yeah. happened in between the emission of the light and us receiving it. It's, yeah. That's really that's really interesting. And it's, so that's why, you know, well, it, it applies to radio waves as well. That's why it's, you know, it's such an important diagnostic of what's going on in the universe to, to, to the, the fact that we do, that, that light does carry with it a record of not only where it came from, but where it passed through on the way as well. Yeah, amazing. Thank you, David. That's a really insightful question and uh, well, well um, asked. Uh, that's it for us uh, in terms of questions today, excuse me. Uh, but if you do have questions for us, uh, please do send them in uh, via our website, spacenutspodcast.com. Spacenuts.io is the other URL. You can use either. Uh, if you put them together, you see us twice. But um, you can send us uh, text and audio questions uh, on our homepage. There's a link on the right or the AMA tab is where you can send questions. Just uh, as long as you've got a device with a microphone, uh, we can take your recorded questions, of course, as I always say. Don't forget to tell us who you are and where you're from. We love to know that. Uh, a couple of those questions came from YouTube, so that's probably why we didn't pick up the names. But uh, it's great to have YouTubers starting to get more involved. 
And and uh, we want uh, people from LinkedIn to get involved as well because we'd like to be able to do lo- live casting via LinkedIn, but we need 150 followers to do that. So if you'd like to follow Bytes.com on LinkedIn uh, and um, join us there, uh, we'll be able to uh, do live uh, output as we record, which is what we're doing today. Although I I'm not feeling very live after all that. But um, it, it's a simple case of going to LinkedIn and just do a search for bytes.com, B-I-T-E-S-Z.com. And uh, yeah, if you follow us there, um, we'll be able to grow our um, our podcast via LinkedIn as well. That brings us to the end of another episode, Fred. Thank you so much. And thanks for um, working your way around our technolo- technological glitches today. We've been having a lot of those. Yeah, but we uh, seem to survive. Hopefully that will continue. Thanks again, Andrew. Always good to talk and speak soon. We will indeed. Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large, part of the team here at Space Nuts. And uh, thanks to Hugh in the studio who didn't turn up and didn't do anything today. But how is that different? And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks to your company. We'll see you on the very next episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.